broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started a few minutes early um, just to go over the intro so that Gretchen and Paloma can begin their presentation. My name is Carly Scarborough. I'm the head campus librarian at Cochise College Douglas campus, and I'm also the ASLA webinar series chair and program committee chair. So thank you for attending today's two webinar blitz sessions, Law for AZ, Empowering Public Libraries to Advance Access of Justice by Gretchen Hornberger, and At Your Service, City Directory Research During a Pandemic by Paloma Phelps. So our first slide here is just some housekeeping notes. Um, webinar participants are in listen-only mode, so you will have to just uh, put questions or comments in the question box, and I will be monitoring those throughout the uh, session. There will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of each presentation, so please submit those questions for our panelists. The session is being recorded, um, and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel, and you'll be emailed uh, information about that when it is provided. Daniel Angerbauer is our technical director today, so if you have any technical issues during the webinar, go ahead and submit a question to the question box letting her know what's going on. Um, and if you're unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number and access code that we have provided at the bottom of this slide. All right, next slide. Our Arizona Library Association wishes to acknowledge the 22 native nations that have inhabited Arizona lands for centuries. We honor the people of these nations on whose ancestral homelands and resources as the member libraries were built. This land acknowledgement is a sign of ASLA's proactivity into the movement of equity, diversity, and inclusivity. We have published this statement on our website and will include it in all of our ASLA Presents 2020 webinar series slides. Uh, this statement represents a welcoming of Indigenous peoples into the library, recognizing their knowledge and land, while we look forward to further engaging with them. Next slide. And we would also like to highlight the Invest in Ed Prop 208. Uh, please join the Teach Our Library Division in their campaign to pass Prop 208. If it passes, schools across the state will receive increased funding and all school library programs will, will benefit. So uh, early voting in Arizona has already started and we have our official election on November 3rd. So please consider taking the pledge to vote for Prop 208. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Today's first program will be presented by Gretchen Hornberger. Gretchen has been the Coconino County Librarian in Flagstaff, Arizona for 20 years. She delivers legal information services across the second largest county in the, in the count, country. Gretchen has an MA in Linguistics from Indiana University and an MA in Library Science from the University of Arizona. In this split session presentation, Law for Arizona will measure the justice gap across Arizona and deliver training and technology building services to public libraries in underserved communities, empowering public libraries to connect their patrons with legal resources. And this program will introduce the Law for AZ project and invite participants feedback on public libraries experience and challenges with patrons legal reference questions. So good morning, Gretchen, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me and thank you to all of you who have joined us this morning. Absolutely. I yes. would, I'd like to share with you today about a program I'm coordinating for the Arizona State Courts. The program is called Law for AZ and it is supported by the Arizona State Library, the Secretary of State's Office, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And the goal of this program is to increase individuals' ability to access information and resources to help them with legal questions and to harness the power of the public library to help increase that access to justice for people in Arizona. There's two phases in this program. Right now we're in phase one in which we are measuring the level of access to justice that people in Arizona have across the state. So we are going to be populating a justice gap map with 
all sorts of data points that measure how easy is it for people to access legal information. It will have demographic measurements in it, such as literacy levels in certain in each region of Arizona. Do people own a car? Do people have access to the internet at their public library? How close are they to their courthouse? How many attorneys are in their community? So a bunch of measures like that are going to go into populating this justice gap map that will give us an instant visual of where is the greatest access to justice and where uh, are our areas of most need to work on to really close that gap. And then phase two is to partner with you, the public libraries, focusing on those areas that we identify as the most underserved in terms of, of access to justice and reaching out to the public libraries in those areas to um, partner with you and offer you services to increase your capacity to provide legal information to your customers. So what is this justice gap? Well, the justice gap is referring to the difference between people's legal needs and their access to legal information. And there's a pretty big gap between those two in the United States. A recent study showed that over the course of a year, 71% of low-income households in the United States had at least one legal problem. So that's quite a large majority of households had at least one legal issue. However, 86% of those households who had legal issues received uh, little to no help with those legal issues. And that is the gap that we are trying to close. Because when you receive, when you do not have your legal issue resolved or you can't find the help that you need, legal issues tend to escalate. They tend to snowball into additional issues, even issues of health, safety, and uh, economic problems. So we want to help legal issues as soon as they arise as best we can. Well, what about legal aid? Don't they provide help to low-income customers with legal problems? They do, and legal aid is a heroic organization. However, their level of funding and their resources available to them only allows them to help um, less than half of the people who come to them seeking help. So of the estimated 1.7 million questions that uh, legal aid should be receiving over the course of a year from low-income people with legal problems, they can only help less than half of those individuals. What about our law libraries? The law libraries in the state are a great resource for people with legal problems, a great place for those folks to start with those questions. Uh, but the law libraries, for the most part, there's just one law library building per county. So you can see on this map uh, where the law libraries are in Arizona, and you can see that there's large swaths of land there where people are living, but there's not a li law library anywhere physically near them. Law libraries, of course, provide our services in a lot of remote ways as well. We help people on the phone, we have websites, we help people over email. But it, is, it does increase someone's access to legal information if they can physically go to their law library. So law libraries, again, are a piece of the puzzle, but not the complete solution. And that's where you come in. So if you could picture one of your patrons uh, making their morning cup of coffee, sitting down at their kitchen table with their coffee, and they're looking for ahead to what they are going to be doing today. And the one thing they're gonna to do today is that their spouse recently filed for divorce, and there's some things in there that they don't agree with. For example, maybe they don't agree with the custody that their spouse asked for. They, this individual drinking their coffee, they need to figure out how can I let the court know I don't agree with those things. So they're planning to go to their courthouse. And here is maybe the type of picture that is coming into their mind as they are anticipating this errand today. To many people, the court and the courthouse and the court system are pretty intimidating. It's a scary unknown 
It's a building that they've maybe never been to. They have to go through security to get into it. There's law enforcement officers in there, judges. There's a whole set of rules and um, procedures that they know nothing about. And everyone is speaking in a foreign language called legalese. So while the information is there, this mere intimidation factor can be a barrier to this person accessing that legal information. On the other hand, if they think, you know, before I go into the courthouse, I think I'm going to go to the public library and check out what new magazines have come in, return some books, see my neighbors, and this might be more the image that comes into their mind. A peaceful, safe, welcoming, known, familiar neighborhood place and a community hub. You all know this about yourselves, that this is what libraries are in our communities. Trusted spaces where the staff are experts in connecting people with information and the staff has a smile on their face, they're eager to help and they're welcoming. So our public is much more likely to feel comfortable going to this space for their legal information than to that more intimidating space. And in addition, public libraries are so much more widespread just in terms of where are these buildings. They're so much more accessible to people than those far and few between courthouses and uh, law libraries. So after phase one, after we do this measuring piece, measuring the justice gap and identifying the regions most in need of uh, increasing people's access to legal information, we're going to reach out to you, the, law, the public libraries in these areas, and offer you these services. One of the services is going to be to share with you some training. I know that probably most of you are already providing legal information or addressing legal questions that your customers are asking you. We have training that we can provide you that can enhance the tools that you have in your toolkit to help those customers. One thing the training will cover is what is the difference between legal information which you and I as librarians can provide, can provide to the public versus legal advice which is a professional service that only an attorney can provide. So any of us, I'm not an attorney, I'm in the same boat as you on this, any of us trying to answer legal questions or connect people with legal information, we have to only provide legal information, not provide legal advice. And that training component will cover this topic. So if you get questions about maybe, um, you know, I'm trying to get this criminal record off of my record because I'm trying to get into nursing school and that's stopping me from being accepted into nursing school. How do I do that? Or uh, with the holidays coming up, um, I'm really concerned about obeying my court order for visitation and sending my kids with the other parents for the holidays because I know they're going to a grandparent's home where they're really being unsafe about protecting everyone from COVID. Can I just not send my kids? So these are the sorts of questions. Maybe you're getting these questions. I'm sure you're getting a lot of other legal questions where in this training, we're going to talk about, well, what part of that is asking for advice? What part is asking for information? The parts that are asking for information, what tools could you have in your toolkit? What, resource could, what resources could you have in your collection or linked to on your website to uh, direct people to or to refer people to to help themselves with their own legal questions? You probably already have some legal resources in your collection. Um, that's an area of expertise for us as law librarians, um, is what is out there, what's available online for free, low cost resources that you might consider that you might not know about yet. So we can also help give you ideas to enhance your existing legal resource collection. And I wanna share with you two resources right now, um, be just because they are timely toward the COVID-19 situation that we are in right now. Uh, so this is an example of the type of resources you could be exposed to through this upcoming training, um, but just two specific ones that might help you right now with legal questions you may be getting right now. 
And the first is this document that gives all of these links related to evictions and housing during COVID-19. So there's a number of legal uh, pieces of assistance for tenants who are facing eviction because they can't pay their rent because of income, their income is being affected by COVID-19. So this gives would give your customer links statewide to what are their legal options and rights right now for avoiding eviction, how can they speak to a free legal aid attorney about this question, and uh, also a bunch of social services about housing assistance, rent assistance, even homeless services. And the other COVID resource I wanted to share with you today is this collection of COVID-19 mini videos on the most asked legal questions that us law librarians are getting right now related to COVID-19. So that last video, COVID-19 parenting time, that would be a resource you could direct that customer to who asked the question about withholding his kids from visitation, or how do I get a protective order during COVID-19? And then another part of the services that we would be offering you, uh, is to become for your public library to become a broadcast receiving site for the free legal talks that we present in Flagstaff at the Flagstaff Law Library. These legal talks are presented by attorneys and other legal professionals, and they're just on a wide and ever growing range of topics that are legal issues that your average person could encounter. There's talks on family law landlord tenant, uh, tribal court versus state court, I'm being sued, now what? Uh, I've got a DUI, what can I expect at my court date? These are presented live at the Flagstaff uh, Law Library and live broadcast. So anyone anywhere can participate in these legal talks from their living room, from a computer at their public library. And we also have a collection or a group a family of broadcast receiving sites across the state, which are mainly public libraries, social service agencies, other government and nonprofit agencies that host the public to come and gather to attend the legal talk. And the, the broadcast receiving site um, will show the legal talk on a screen or on a laptop in a meeting room, for example. So this just gives more people access to this information. And the vision of this legal talks and the broadcast receiving sites is that we are creating this information, presenting the information in one little location in Arizona, Flagstaff, and then using a technology web to cover the state and to bring that information to people all across the state. So part of the Law 4 AZ uh, services to public libraries will be for us to the law libraries to help you analyze what is your current tech capacity to become a broadcast receiving site and there would possibly also be funding to help you increase your tech capacity so that you could become a broadcast receiving site and bring this legal information to the people in your community. So where we're at today is that I would like to um, ask you to participate in a survey that I'm going to be emailing out within a few weeks to help us populate that justice gap map, the map that's gonna show us what is the level of access to justice across Arizona. The survey is gonna gather some of the data points that are going, in, going to go into the map. We are surveying the law libraries, we're surveying the courts, and we're surveying the public libraries. It will be a short list of very basic, simple questions, such as does, do, does your library provide the internet, internet access to your patrons at the library? Um, so some of the library districts, the survey is going to go to the district director, and it will be um, their decision for your specific area, whether they're going to do the survey for all the libraries or send surveys out to the individual libraries. And then in other, for other libraries, you'll be getting the survey directly from us. But I um, encourage you and I thank you in advance for taking the time to fill out this survey so that we can really have a rich 
an accurate data set of the access to justice measures to really give us the accurate picture of access to justice across Arizona. And um, since I don't have a, a um, camera on the computer I'm talking to you from, I, I included my picture here at the end so you can see me. And I hope that you feel welcome to contact me if you have questions about the Law for AZ program, uh, where we're at, or any questions about the presentation. Of course, I can try to answer some questions right now as well. And please also feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about providing legal information to your patrons. Gretchen, I did have a question. The broadcasts that you mentioned, are those still happening with it being COVID? Are libraries still hosting those or have they been put on pause? Right, so during COVID, I think most of us were not, were not gathering in person and that's true for our legal talks as well. We're still doing our legal talks program full force, but no one is gathering in person at the Flagstaff Law Library for them. Instead, they're completely over Zoom. So whether you're in Flagstaff or Pima County, um, it's over Zoom for everybody. And I don't actually know um, how it's working for all of our broadcast receiving sites if they have paused that. Um, because we basically send out the information about the talk and we send out some uh, documents that the broadcast receiving sites can use to advertise the talks in their specific areas. But after that, it's up to them. So I'm not sure how they are changing operations due to COVID-19 right now. Okay, we did get another question in. You mentioned working with public libraries. Have you considered reaching out to tribal libraries, community college libraries, or even museum libraries, such as the Heard Museum in Phoenix? That is a fantastic idea. And in, in the first iteration of Law for AZ, we're focusing on the, the public libraries. Um, there, that's a lot of libraries. <laughs> so we're focusing on that right now. And then in the future, though, this program could certainly grow and should certainly grow in those directions. And I hadn't thought about museum libraries. Um, that's a great idea, and thank you for that. Absolutely, and I work at a community college library and we get, even we get lots of legal questions. We're very close to Bisbee, Arizona, which is, I believe there's a law library in Bisbee, um, and that is like our county records, so. It would be interesting to have something at our community college as well because we do get a fair amount of patrons asking legal questions at our libraries. Yes, great idea and that is definitely going to be part of the picture of connecting people across the state and all the different small regions of the state with legal information. All right, we don't have any more questions. Is there anything, uh, anything else you wanted to add? No, thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. I do have one more thing for the attendees. Um, in the chat box, I'm going to put in a link to a um, survey. We're asking that everybody who attended fill out the survey for us uh, just for your feedback. Um, so I went ahead and put that in the chat form. So just at your earliest convenience, if you could fill that out and you'll get another link for Paloma's presentation afterwards. So this one is for Gretchen's uh, session here. So. Thank you so much, Gretchen, for your time. That was a wonderful presentation, um, and we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. All right, so today's second program will be, today's second program will be presented by Paloma Phelps. Paloma Phelps is the Arizona Collection Librarian for the State of Arizona Research Library. This split session <clears throat> presentation will highlight the State of Arizona Research Libraries enhanced service to provide access to city directories, while many libraries have restricted access due to the pandemic. City directories are the highest use item in the Arizona collection and have numerous uses from the environmental site assessments, obtaining a certificate of occupancy, genealogical research, or simply the curiosity of local residents. Uh, and so here, oh, uh, here we will have Gretchen, uh, do her presentation.
Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Can you see my screen? We, yes, we can see your slides. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, hi, good morning. Thank you for joining me today. Um, my name is Paloma Phelps and I'm the Arizona Collection Librarian at the State of Arizona Research Library. So today I'll be talking about city directories, a very important part of the Arizona Collection, along with the adjustments and accomplishments the library has made to continue to make city directories accessible to patrons during the pandemic. So what are city directories and why are they important? City directories are books that contain alphabetical listings of adult residents of a city, town, or other area. Additionally, they include street address listings, business listings, and business advertisements of the same area. Because they are published annually and cover many decades of development, city directories truly are a time capsule that captures the makeup of a city or town in that particular year. So these might be a little difficult to read, but I wanted to include these two pages that come from a 1965 city directory for Glendale, Arizona, because they describe pretty clearly what some of the uses were for city directories at the time that they were published. So city directories were a major source of advertising for local businesses and a major source of information on the makeup of a city and its residents. So the page on the left says the city directory will answer your everyday questions and poses a huge number of questions, some of them being questions about an individual, such as how do they spell their name, are they married, do they own a home, and what do they do for a living, or questions about a business concern, such as what is the correct name and address, who are the partners or chief officers, and where are the branch locations or questions about a locality like how do the streets run what's the quickest way to get there where's the nearest store church school garage etc so these remind me of all the things that we would be able to google today or find on social media or other public records and because city directories were meant to provide the most updated information, they were meant to be discarded after a new directory was published. Luckily, many copies stuck around and have become incredibly important resources in the present day, although their uses have changed over time. So let's look more closely at the components of a city directory listing. Here's a small section from the alphabetical name listings in a 1925 Phoenix City Directory. So the alphabetical name listings contain a wealth of information. Listings often show an individual's address, occupation, marital status, and number of adults in the same household. So you can imagine how useful this information might be today if you were researching family history, for example. So let's look at a few specific examples. Underlined here, you can see a listing for an individual named Jacob Bader. In parentheses is the name Nettie. So that would be Jacob Bader's spouse. So in 1925, they resided at 1417 East Washington Street in Phoenix. Um, so I looked up this address in Google Maps, and it's an auto repair shop now. So that's one of the interesting things you can do with city directories is you can look up a certain address, whether it's your own or a place that you know well, and you can see how your city has changed over the decades. Here's another example. Um, oh, one thing to note is that the use of abbreviations and initials are very common in the alphabetical name listings. So you may want to check the first few pages of the directory because there's typically a key which explains all the abbreviations that are used. So in this example, we have a listing for someone named Maria Badia. And we see next to her name that it says WID, which stands for widow. And next to that, we see the initials JJ. So that would have been the name of her spouse. So while we do not have the deceased spouse's full name, 
It's possible that we may be able to find it by checking directories from earlier than 1925 while he was still living. And we see that she resides at 924 East Jefferson Street in Phoenix. So here's one more example because it clearly shows the occupation. This is a listing for someone named May Bagshaw and we can see that she was a nurse and resided at 1030 East Willetta Street. Similarly, street address listings contain information on who resided at a particular address, but street address listings were able to capture both the renters and owners who resided at the address at the time. You can also see cross streets and intersections street name changes or additions, or you could possibly determine the construction date of a building or residence by researching when it first appeared. So we can see this is from a Tucson City directory from 1935. One of the listings states Arizona Avenue south from Congress between 5th and 6th Avenues. So that's pretty specific. So today, City directories are used for very different purposes, but are valuable resources for things like genealogy research, environmental site assessments on commercial and residential buildings, or simply for personal interest. City directories are the most highly used materials in the Arizona collection. When the pandemic restricted public visitation, it was important to adjust our service model to keep city directories continuously accessible while also prioritizing the safety of patrons and staff. To accomplish this, limited staff were designated to conduct city directory research on behalf of the patrons in order to accommodate social distancing and limit handling by multiple users. Patrons could now submit their research requests through LibAnswers and typically include anywhere from one to five addresses in their search request. We then provide scanned images of the city directory pages from the start and end date requested, as well as five year intervals in between. So for example, if somebody requested research on an address from 1965 to 2020, we would include images for 1965, 1970, 1975, and et cetera. So earlier I mentioned environmental site assessments, and that is probably the most common request we receive from patrons. Environmental site assessments involve researching the current and historical uses of a property as part of a commercial real estate transaction. So the intention of the report is to assess if current or historic property uses have impacted the soil or groundwater beneath the property and could pose a threat to the environment or to human health. Similarly, we receive many city directory requests from property or business owners who need a certificate of occupancy issued by the city government and would need to show the current and past occupants of the building. So a patron may submit a ticket on LibAnswers that states, I would like city directory research on 3230 South Arizona Avenue in Chandler, Arizona between the years 1940 and 2020. So I would go to my giant cart of city directories and start looking up the address, starting with 2020, then going back in five year intervals. So 2015, 2010, all the way to 1965. Directories earlier than 1965 are available online, which I will talk more about in a little bit. So I would send the patron the online link along with the folder of city directory images. And I typically take a photograph of the directory page on an iPad and the patron can zoom in on the listing once they get the image. So doing a handful of these requests per day might sound a little tedious, but I think it's interesting and it's also satisfying to be able to send the patrons the information that they need. So this graph shows the number of requests we have received over time since beginning the service. 
I started with April because April was really the first month that in-person services were altered to be in compliance with the stay-at-home orders. So in the month of April, there were 21 requests. In May, there were 18. In June, there were 36. July, 37. August, 66. And September, 81. So you might notice that there was a significant jump between July and August. And that is because staff met in early August to look at the data on these city directory requests. And we realized that we would be getting more granular information if we split the request up by address. Many patrons typically submit one address at a time, but many have also started to submit two to five addresses at once. So to more accurately account for staff time and research time, we broke the request down by the single address. So the State of Arizona Research Library was also able to greatly enhance our online collection of city directories during the pandemic. In 2019, the library entered into a scanning partnership with Family Search International to scan items from the Arizona collection that are of historical and genealogical value. Family Search provided digital scanning equipment and trained volunteers to create digital images of the material. And we would then upload the copies to our online platform, Arizona Memory Project. When the pandemic started and having volunteers in the library was put on hold, staff worked on uploading materials to the Arizona Memory Project, and we were able to add 220 digitized city directories spanning from the 1880s to early 1960s and covering many cities and towns all over the state. This was a major accomplishment in increasing access to city directories in a time when in-person services were unexpectedly limited. And here's just a few other links to other online collections that we were able to enhance with our Family Search partnership. If you're interested in other aspects of Arizona history, after browsing all the city directories. So here's how you can find Arizona city directories online through the Arizona Memory Project. You can access the Arizona Memory Project by visiting azmemory.azlibrary.gov. From the homepage here, you will click on the Arizona History and Culture Collection. From there, Scroll down on this page until you reach City Directories of Arizona. Once selected, you will be taken to the collections landing page and you can click on Browse and Search Collection. So this is the City Directory Collection on AMP. One of the biggest recommendations I have for navigating this collection is to make good use of the search filters on the left hand side of the page. So you are able to narrow down the results by locality, so the name of the city or town, by the county, by temporal coverage, which will show you all the results within a decade, or if you're looking for one specific year, you can search through the date original. So, for example, let's say I wanted to look up city directories in Phoenix. I could narrow down the scope of the collection through the locality filter by selecting Phoenix. Using that filter, you can see that I narrowed down the search results from 25 to 6. You can also see there are several other results that capture other areas of Phoenix, but what we're currently looking for our directories from the city of Phoenix. So I will go ahead and select the one that just says Phoenix. Once you select the city you're interested in searching, you will see this page. We currently have the 1903 Phoenix City directory selected, but to navigate through different years, you can go to the right side of the page here to view the other years that are available. City directories are organized here chronologically. So I know that for Phoenix, the most recent year we have available is 1961. So if you were looking for city directories from the 1950s or 1960s, you would want to check pages four or five. 
so once you've made your selection and I use the 1945 city directory for this example, you would select view to expand the file. Depending on the size of the file, it may take a few minutes to load. Once the view is expanded, you will see the first page of the directory and you can either scroll down to browse through the pages or you can do a keyword search by hitting control F or you can select the magnifying glass icon on the top left corner of the page to start a keyword search. So in this example, I entered a street name in Phoenix. You can see when there's a matching keyword, it will be highlighted in green in the file. And I think you can also see that there are 742 other matches throughout the directory. So depending on what you're trying to find, it could be more efficient to do a keyword search. But if you're searching for a common term like Main Street or a common surname, it may end up being more efficient to scroll down to the section that you're looking for. So let's pretend that we're looking for Roosevelt in the street name section because we wanted to see who resided there in 1945. Once there, you can see a mix of residents, apartment complexes, and businesses that were located on this particular intersection of West Roosevelt Street and North Central Avenue in 1945. So if you would like to conduct city directory research yourself or recommend the resource to your patrons, please visit the Arizona Memory Project at azmemory.azlibrary.gov or for more resources from our print collection, you can visit our homepage at azlibrary.org to submit a request through LibAnswers by scrolling to the bottom of our homepage to select Ask a Question. And that is it. Thank you so much. Uh, here's my contact information if anyone has any questions and a link to our homepage. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paloma. Just wait. So far, just a comment, great information, which I absolutely agree. Wonderful resource to have. Thank you. Yes, I agree. City directories are eternally interesting. <laughs> Especially as more and more we start to do, like you said, the ancestry and, you know, you find where your ancestor lived and then you want to see, you know, the what else was on that block. And I just, it is so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Things really change over time as well. I know the Arizona Memory Project also has photos and, and it's just a wealth of information. The Cochise College has a couple of photo archives in there as well and I'm constantly looking through to see the new stuff that gets added because it's just fascinating. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I definitely recommend um, checking out some of the links I included in the presentation. That's all new stuff that we were able to upload um, from our Family Search partnership, and there's just a wealth of information there, including yearbooks, which are really cool. Oh, that's amazing. Yes. And these slides will be made available to all of the presenters on our website. So um, if you didn't get a chance to jot that information down, don't worry. We will get these uploaded on um, onto the ASBA website so you can scroll through the slides yourself. All right, were there any questions for Gretchen or uh, for Paloma? I apologize. All right, well, thank you so much, Paloma. Again, uh, attendees, I'm gonna put in the chat the link to the uh, form, if you could fill that out uh, for Gretchen's uh, presentation here. And just give a second to go back to our slides. There we go. So we just wanted to highlight our next program is going to be next Monday, October 26th at 3 p.m. Michelle Miranda Thorstad, Joe Lassen, and Le Lenore Filipskuk will present Bring Inclusive, I apologize, Bring Inclusivity to Story Hour, serving the LGBTQ plus community and beyond. So please register for that event as well. And we hope to see you all there. And then as we close out, we can just pull up our uh, our last slide here is just our final schedule. Um, and we hope to see you at all of our events. Uh, like we said, there is one every single week. We just skipped the week of Thanksgiving um, and then we'll have our closing session Wednesday, December 9th 
from 8.45 to 1. So we hope to see you at all of our webinars. And we'll leave this up for just a few minutes. Um, I see the, the session's going to end a little early. If you need to get going, you're welcome to head out. And please, if you have any questions um, or you need to reach out to us, you can email us at conference.programs at asla.org. I can go ahead and put that in the chat as well. All right, thank you so much for attending today and we hope you all have a great day.